One of the most essential skills you can have in sedimentary geology is the ability to recognize and describe lithology, and more importantly, to distinguish rocks that differ in terms of lithology. The lithology of a rock is its set of physical characteristics, such as its color and the sizes and shapes of its grains. In this video, we're going to explore the observable characteristics of clastic rocks, specifically terrigenous and siliciclastic rocks. Recall that these rocks consist of clasts or lithogenous sediment made up of particles and grains derived from weathering and erosion of pre-existing rocks. Clearly, not all clastic rocks are the same. There is a lot of variation. Some of this variation is due to differences in color. There are some cases where the color of a rock is very meaningful. For example, the colors of rocks are very useful in stratigraphy, allowing one to distinguish between two strata when viewing them from a distance. The color can also help you to identify the rocks. Amber, for example, has a very distinctive yellow or orange color. And rocks like shale and coal are often gray or black in appearance because they often contain a lot of carbonaceous material, a form of organic matter which is black in appearance. That said, generally speaking, there is a limit to the usefulness of color. Take, for example, these rocks. Both of these rocks are considered mudstones or shales, but only one of them is black. Clearly, not all shales are black. Instead, the colors of many sedimentary rocks depend on their compositions. Specifically, the chemistry of their minerals that contain iron. You see, the iron atom has 26 electrons, which orbit its nucleus like planets. However, when iron reacts with other elements to form minerals, it readily gives up several of these electrons to other elements, particularly oxygen. Iron gives up several of its electrons to oxygen. Depending on how much oxygen is present and how many electrons it receives, the iron may ultimately be present in one of two forms. If it gives up two electrons, it will be present as ferrous iron. But if it gives up three electrons, then it will be present as ferric iron. Where as ferrous iron tends to produce greenish colors, ferric iron produces red. Therefore, the color of many sedimentary rocks is related to reactions between iron and oxygen during their deposition. Red sedimentary rocks come from environments with lots of oxygen, such as rivers and shallow marine environments. Green rocks, on the other hand, are presumed to come from environments with low concentrations of oxygen, such as deep marine settings. And black rocks generally originate in environments where there is no oxygen present to contribute to the decay and breakdown of the organic matter that gives them their color. Of course, this is just a generalization. Color is very misleading, and it is one of the most difficult things to interpret about a sedimentary rock. It is usually better instead to focus on three other features of sedimentary rocks. Texture, fabric, and surface features. The texture describes the sizes and shapes of the clasts in the rock. Some clastic rocks consist of very large grains, 
We generally refer to any rock made of clasts that you can see with the naked eye as coarse grained. Not only are the grains large, but they feel rough to the touch. They feel coarse. Other clastic rocks consist of very small grains, clasts that are too small to see except with a hand lens or microscope. The clasts are so small, you can't even feel them with your hand. The rock feels smooth. We refer to these rocks as fine grained. One of the most common approaches to describing class size is to use the Wentworth scale, which divides clasts into a number of ranges based on their size. The range is primarily based on texture. A good geologist doesn't need to measure the grains. They can identify the rocks by sight and feel, a skill that takes time to learn and develop. Of course, the size and shape of the class in a rock may not be uniform. Some rocks consist of clasts which are all the same size. In this case, we say that the rock is well sorted. Other rocks have clasts that are poorly sorted. They have clasts of many different sizes. And of course, some clasts may be very angular in shape, while others are round or spheroidal. Describing the shape of a class can be very challenging, and there are a number of mathematical approaches to doing so. These approaches generally involve measuring the long and short diameters or axes of the grains, so you can get a sense if clasts are longer in one dimension than they are in, an, in another. Naturally, clasts are three-dimensional and often come in very irregular shapes. So in practice, analyzing particle shape is very difficult. Even so, this simple approach allows one to differentiate between class shapes of four N members. Equant and discoid class are most common. Equant classes are roughly spheroidal or cubic in shape. Their length does not vary from one dimension to the next. Discoid and oblate class are essentially flattened disks and spheres. Bladed and rod-shaped class are comparatively rare. Even so, the shape of a class can, in some cases, tell you a lot about its origin. Bedrocks that break into slabs, like limestone and sandstone, for example, tend to produce flat, discoidal, and oblate grains. Rod-shaped clasts, in contrast, tend to come from metamorphic rocks with strong linear fabrics like this schist. In any case, geologists use the sizes and shapes of clasts to distinguish between the main types of terrigenous rocks. The clastic rocks with the largest clasts are called breccia and conglomerates. In both cases, the rocks are poorly sorted. You may find clasts ranging in size from clay to pebbles. The largest class are gravel or pebble sized. The only difference between a breccia and a conglomerate is the shapes of their clasts. Conglomerate clasts are well-rounded. Breccia clasts are angular. Sandstone, like breccia and conglomerate, is a coarse-grained rock. You can see and feel the clasts. Sandstone has a texture like sandpaper. The clasts themselves may be angular, rounded, poorly sorted, or well-sorted. It would not be out of the question to call it a well-sorted sandstone or an angular sandstone. Really, the defining feature of a sandstone is the sizes of the clasts. As we begin to looking at clastic rocks with smaller clasts, 
it becomes more challenging to distinguish the different types of terrigenous rocks. Siltstone consists of silt size class, meaning it is a fine grain rock. You can hardly see or feel the clasts in a siltstone. The best way to identify one is to look at it under a microscope. But if you are in a pinch, there is another way. All you have to do is break off a little chip of the rock and nibble on it a little bit. If it feels gritty against your teeth, it's probably a siltstone. And yes, sedimentary geologists actually do this all the time, carefully of course. The clastic rocks with the smallest clay size clasts are called mudstones, claystones, and shales. You can nibble on these rocks all day long. You won't feel any grit on your teeth. The clasts are simply too small. Overall, the texture of a clastic rock depends on its depositional environment and the conditions under which it was deposited. Some environments accumulate coarse grain sediment, whereas others are sites of silt and clay deposition. Rivers, for example, often produce coarse grained and poorly sorted clastic rocks like breccias, conglomerates, and sandstones. Of course, rivers are not the only environment to produce sandstones such as these. Not surprisingly, environments like beaches can also produce sandstone. Therefore, to determine the origin of a clastic rock, a sedimentary geologist must look not just at its texture, but also at its fabric. The fabric of a clastic rock is the orientation or arrangement of its clasts. Clasts can be randomly arranged or they can be oriented with respect to each other. A common example of oriented clasts is called imbrication. In a clastic rock with imbrication, discoidal clasts are stacked up and oriented in a specific direction. Imbrication develops in environments where there is a current of flowing water or air, which transports the clasts and causes them to line up in a single direction. This arrangement of oriented clasts becomes established because it offers the least resistance to flow. Water or air has an easier time flowing over imbricated clasts than randomly arranged ones. The clasts are simply going with the flow. For this reason, oriented clasts, and in particular, imbrication, is very useful as a paleocurrent indicator. If you find imbrication in a clastic rock, it can help you to identify the direction of flow in an ancient depositional environment. But we'll save that topic for another day. Fabric also refers to how the clasts are packed together and the nature of their contacts. Packing is complex because clasts are never perfectly uniform in shape or size. However, if we imagine that all of the clasts in a rock are spheres of equal size, we can distinguish between two alternative ways of packing clasts together. In cubic packing, each sphere of an overlying layer rests directly above the sphere of the layer beneath it. In contrast, in rhombohedral packing, each sphere of an overlying layer rests in the depression between spheres of the layer below. The fabric of a rock affects its porosity, 
or in other words, the amount of space between the grains. This space is not surprisingly called pore space. In many cases, this pore space is filled by cements made of minerals like quartz or calcite. However, in some cases, the pore spaces remain empty voids. In these cases, the pore space may be filled by fluid liquids and gases like water, oil, or natural gas. In any case, the amount of pore space and the amount of porosity depends on the packing of the clasts and the grains. Clastic rocks with cubic packing have a looser arrangement of clasts than those with rhombohedral packing. As a result, cubically packed rocks are more porous and more likely to contain voids filled with gases or liquids. Why does this porosity matter? Why do we care about it? The porosity of a rock affects its permeability or the capacity of water or other fluids to flow between the clasts. The higher the porosity, the greater the permeability. Permeability is an important consideration for those looking for sedimentary resources like oil and natural gas, which generally occur between the class of porous reservoir rocks. These reservoirs get their oil and gas from source rocks located beneath them, which are often impermeable shales, sandstones, and limestones. The higher the permeability of the reservoir, the easier it becomes to extract oil or gas from it. In an ideal case, the oil and natural gas should flow very easily through the pore space, ultimately moving out of the reservoir and into the rigs for extraction. In addition, an understanding of the permeability of the rocks can also help in exploration. The best reservoirs for oil are often located between impermeable seal rocks, which effectively trap the crude oil and prevent it from migrating out of the reservoir. Therefore, in oil exploration, geologists often search for and target reservoirs located above impermeable source rocks and located below impermeable cap rocks. A final concern beyond the texture and fabric and color of a clastic rock is the presence of grain surface features on its clasts. Grain surface features are exactly what they sound like, features visible on the surfaces of clasts. The larger the grain, the easier it is to see these features. So generally speaking, Surface features are easiest to find on gravel-sized pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. That said, you can also observe surface features on sand-sized grains with the use of sophisticated electron microscopes. There are many different types of surface features, and they are produced by a variety of different geologic processes. Determining the origin of surface features like these can be difficult at times. We can't always know the processes responsible for them. And some processes produce the same types of surface features. That said, some surface features are distinctive and can be attributed to one and only one geologic process. These narrow straight linear scratches are called striations. They are typically created by erosion caused by glaciers. Glaciers grow, move, and shrink over time. As they move over the earth, they carve into the bedrock, 
creating these striations in the process. Another important surface feature is called frosting. Frosted grains have the appearance of frosted glass. They aren't perfectly clear or transparent. They scatter and diffuse light. This feature tends to be created by the transport and erosion of sediment by wind. Frosting is caused by many high velocity grain to grain collisions during storms like this one. During these dust storms, the grains collide with each other. The consequence of all of these collisions is grain frosting. Overall, there are dozens of types of grain surface features, far too many to review here. You will learn about them over time. Until then, keep an eye out. The best way and the best reason to learn about a surface feature is to discover it yourself.